test one, two. Mr. Groves, how are you doing today? Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Do I have to unmute you? Got it. There you go. How's it going? It's going. It's working. It's happening. We're getting deals done. <laughs> That's always good to hear. That's always good to hear. Uh, let's, let's give it a few more minutes so for some people to pop on here, and then, uh, and then we'll get started. Yep. Good morning, Blanca. Good morning, Charity. Good morning, Desiree. Good morning, Kim, Liz, Sue, Tina. Or afternoon now, I guess we're in the afternoon hours. Yes, that's what I meant to say. Frank, you look like you were born for a podcast, dude. I think we should just shut down the office and do everything virtually. There like we go. The hair, the mic, the tie, everything <laughs> looks like you were born to do this. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm like in my underwear, so. It's <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I'm actually in the office. I think there's, um, I have escrow in the office. Um, Tracy's here. And my MCA is here, and that's really it. So uh, I saw your post on Facebook about all the books you're reading. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to stay, you know, it's like if we're stuck at home, we might as well sharpen that sword, right, or sharpen the axe. So I'm just, you know, I wrote a book on lead generation, not a surprise. But there's four, there's four, thank you. There's four other books, um, and I'll put these, um, I'll put these in the link. Uh, is that upside down? Yeah, that's upside down. I'll put these all in the uh, in the Facebook group. A link to them so that people can pick them up. Like, man, it for especially for realtors, if they haven't read "Never Lose a Customer Again," um, and if they haven't read "Building a Story Brand," they're just awesome. And then right after I wrote my book, I got I got to meet this guy Jeb Blunt, and I was like, thank God I didn't read this book first because I wouldn't have written mine. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's like. Uh. Well, your book has some really, really amazing things in here. And actually, as I, uh, as I was putting this webinar together and, and going through all the questions that people were asking me, I was, um, I was like, oh, wow, you have a lot of, you pretty much have everything that we're going to talk about in this book. So, oui. so that's really cool. Um, one of the books that I'm reading right now that I think is really super important is, um, is Shift. There's a lot of really good stuff in this book that is applying to right now. There it is. <laughs> um, but the whole reason I'm doing this webinar is this, there's a lot of stuff that applies in this book, but there's a whole bunch of new territory that we're in right now. That is, um, it is, uh, I'm just going to say it. It's freaking people out. Yeah. No. And I think it's okay to be scared, right? Like sometimes fear uh, is a good driver of activity. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to see if I'm going to share my screen here and then we are going to, uh, work on getting all of this going. So we're at one o'clock. So I think we should really um, <clears throat> just get started because um, I don't know how, I, I can talk a lot. I know you can too. So we might even run more than an hour. So we'll have to see how this goes. For sure, let's go. Um, all right, so lead generation in today's world. So today's world is a completely different world. I, I can safely say, I don't think anybody has seen or experience what's going on right now. Um, and regardless, and I know there's gonna be people from around the country that are gonna be watching this and viewing this. So take, take it with a grain of salt, depending on where you are at in the country, because I know, I think out of all the, most places real estate is labeled as essential. But I know state of California, it's labeled essential, but then when you break it down to counties and LA city orders, those trump what the state does and that means that if your, your county is deeming you non-essential, then you are technically have to obey the stay-at-home orders, and it's really hard to work, period. Um, and all I'm going to say to that is that I am the king of asking for forgiveness before I ask for permission. So if you go to my broker, he's going to tell you one thing, and I can guarantee you if you come to me, I'm going to tell you something different as far as what you should be doing. But at the end of the day, you have to stay safe and you have to stay healthy. Um, so I, I saw this in one of your posts and if you do, if you have any of the Keller Williams listing presentations, um, you know what, why don't we do this before we get into this? I think we sh should probably introduce ourselves, shouldn't we? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Frank Bernardo. I've been in real estate since 2004. I've been with Keller Williams. 
I run a large real estate office in the San Fernando Valley that does anywhere between 200 and 350 million in sales a year. Um, we have about close to 200 agents in our office and um, I've been doing this successfully for about four years, but I've been a successful real estate agent for much longer than that. Um, and I have the great pleasure of, uh, you know, Scott Groves um, being um, one of the lenders in my office. So Scott Groves, tell me a little bit about yourself. Your, your resume is much longer than mine. Uh, you know, sa same boring stuff, right? Scott Groves has been a loan officer for 20 years, been uh, really successful some years, been really broke some years. And uh, because of the times that I was broke, the things that I found that kind of got me through it was, you know, not surprisingly lead generation that turned into a coaching program that turned into a book called lead generate 61 days to double your pay. Maybe right now we should call it 61 days to get back on track um, because I think that's really what it's going to be all about. And so I'm just excited to talk to you today about, you know, um, kind of what we control, what we can't control and how we, we keep lead generating and staying in connection with people. Cause I think, you know, without that, we're not going to have a job to go back to after this passes in 30 or 60 days, which, you know, it will. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So you posted something similar to this. And I think when, um, so we, if you have a Keller Williams listing presentation, there's a couple of slides in there that are similar to this, but I want, I tweaked it a little bit to make it more as far as what's going on right now. So what do we actually have control over? And I think this is really, really important because there's a lot of people that are sitting at home um, drinking like, you know, I am. Um, and they're just taking this as like a break or a vacation and they're not actually doing some of the things that they can actually do. So um, the first thing is your personal health. So if you've tried to go to Walmart or Target and buy weights, you can't because they're all gone. People have bought up all the weights and all this stuff like that. And so your personal health, I think, is really important to really pay attention because when we come out of this thing and it should be one of the number one things on your list on a daily basis, regardless of what's going on in the world. Um, so number two, your personal finances. Um, and that's something that I think uh, Scott and I are gonna talk um, going through this whole thing. I did a video, a YouTube video on what you should be doing with your personal finances right now. Um, that's on my YouTube channel, <clears throat> which I have the link at the very end of this thing, so you can go check it out. Um, but you should be remargining yourself and really paying attention to what you have, what you're spending and what you're doing and slicing everything to the bone that is not giving you a return on investment. That's the short version. Would you agree with that, Scott? Totally agree. We're doing some stuff here in my business to like double down our money on our marketing efforts because I think the strong always come out of calamity with more market share, but everywhere else that I can cut, I am cutting and just kind of, you know, hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst. Absolutely. Um, you and your family's personal safety and hygiene. So that's something that you have 100% control over, keeping yourself safe. I know some people are all in on this quarantine thing and some people are not. And you have to do what's best for you and your family. But at the end of the day, you have control over how that goes, um, how you show up and treat yourself and others. Uh, so there's already YouTube videos on out, out there about people fighting for toilet paper. Um, we're going to get through this, people. I, some of us might have bruises, some of us might have bumps, some of us might, might have some scars. We're going to have battle wounds for sure when we get through whatever this is. Um, but you have to show up for yourself and you have to treat people with kindness and be nice. Like that's just, you can say whatever you want to in your head and under your breath or whatever, but at the end of the day, that kind of shows like, what do they say? When you squeeze lemons, you get lemonade. When somebody gets squeezed and pressures put on them, what comes out, that's what's inside them. So you have to really, really pay attention to how you're treating people. Um, and then your daily actions. <clears throat> so this is what's going to get you out of this situation. And this is one of the things Scott and I are going to be talking about through this is the things that you wake up and do on a daily basis that you're consistent with and that you put your work ethic into is really what's going to help you get through this. And we're going to try to give you some tools to, uh, to make it a little bit easier for you. So let's go to the fun stuff, the stuff you don't have control over. So I think uh, if, you're, if you work for a company that's publicly traded, or if you had your retirement in the stock market, um, you probably have a little anxiety right now. <laughs> um, where are we at? Let's, let's look at the stock market. Well, it's all green right now. It's not looking too bad, but you can't control the stock market. Um, I think we're about to see that you cannot control the real estate market in any way, shape or form. 
Um, you cannot control interest rates. Um, right now, I refied when everything started to kind of go a little crazy and I refied, I think I got a 2.99% refi rate, which is awesome. Um, but interest rates, there was a point in time, and this is long before you and I, Scott, were around, that interest rates were like at 16%. And people have such short memories that they don't remember that that was really bad. So interest rates right now are really amazing, but you don't control them. And the explanation on how to control them is so far in a different conversation that I even don't even want to have right now. Um, the coronavirus, you can't control the coronavirus. You can't control what the government does. Um, and anything else that has nothing to do with you personally, you don't have control over any of that stuff. Would you like to add any, anything to that, Scott? No, I think this just gets down to everything that we need to be thinking about is like control the controllables, right? It's like, I, I can watch CNN all day long and see what the horrific numbers are and see, you know, I, I understand people are dealing with real calamity, but all I can do is make sure my family is clean, healthy, eating right, you know, not smoking, not morbidly obese, yeah. all the things that kind of sway the, 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 the data in our favor. Um, and those are the things we can control. I'm not, I'm not going to spend my day focusing on the things I can't control. Yep. Yep. So <clears throat> the problem right now, I have like my screens like covering things here. My problem right now, the problem right now. So, so this is what I see. And I, I would love Scott's input on this. The, there's multiple problems depending on where you are in your business. And what I've, what I realized is that a very small number of real estate agents can actually weather three months of non-business, which is potentially what we're looking at. Um, the majority of real estate agents, I believe, are not prepared for what's about to happen. Um, and so my question to realtors is, what do you think is about to happen? And the truth of the matter, um, I, don't, I don't think that we should try to prognosticate anything in the future as far as how long this is going to be, what's going to happen, how this is going to play out. Only thing we can, we can go back to the couple of slides ago, we can only control ourselves and our daily activities. So to dwell on the future of what could quote unquote possibly happen, I have no interest in that. I have no interest in trying to scare the shit out of myself. Oh, and you can swear on this podcast too, uh, on this podcast, on this video thing, you can swear. Scott. Sweet. Um, so this is this, and, I, and your opinion here is really because you have this, this book here for everybody. Contact Scott for it. Um, I think the three things that you need in your business right now, this second, is you need a planner, a daily schedule planner. You need a database and a website. And I, so last year, I brought on to two different offices, I brought on over 147 real estate agents into Keller Williams. And I cannot tell you how many of those agents that I brought on that had either no database or did not use their database. And right now, right now, your database, in my opinion, is the most important thing that you could possibly have in your arsenal. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent, because um, nobody wants to hear from a cold call right now. I think there's an opportunity to deepen relationships, you know, check in with people who you have a fringe relationship with, but nobody wants to be cold called in these times of calamity. No, not at all. Um, a website gives you social presence, um, I, you know, and we can, and beyond that, you can jump onto social media and do all these different things. But that, as far as bare bones is what you need, you need something, a planner to schedule yourself, a database to put people in and to follow up and to create a plan. And you need a website out there for people to go to. Um, those are the main three things. And then if, if you ask me the fourth thing, I would say you need a real estate coach. Um, so I'm really... I'm, I'm, I'm really biased on a re being a real estate coach. So I coach agents. That's, that's one of the things I coach my team. I coach people all the time. I've been coaching for years. Um, I was rookie of the year in 2004 for Keller Williams for the LA region. And I actually coach and train the next rookie of the year that superseded me the year after that. So I've been training and coaching agents since day one. Um, and I am, there's Tom Ferries, there's Mike Ferries, there's, um, Howard people, there's a whole bunch of different coaches out there, but I think you have to be very discerning about who you pick and who you choose because a lot of coaches out there are just in it for the money and they're not actually in it to give you the quality advice that you need to survive in the time that you need it the most. So I'm not going to tell you my personal feelings about certain real estate coaches, 
but everybody has a certain personality and you need to make sure that you have the right coach that's going to help you when you need it and not just pat you on the back and um, tell you that you're great all the time. Um, I know that, so one reason I have Scott on here is because our personalities are very similar and I really appreciate the way he talks to agents, the way he disseminates information, the way he coaches. Um, I read his book, again, read his book, it's amazing. And I think him and I are both on the same page that we wanna tell people what they need to hear and not what they wanna hear. And I think that is a really, really big deal when it comes to coaching is that your coach should not be your friend all the time. Your coach should, there's times I've had people in my uh, office and they've left my office crying. And it's because I'm telling them what they need to hear because there's too many of us that BS ourselves and we end up not being able to close as many deals as we want to because of that. And that's, you know, did I say anything wrong there, Scott? No, I think it's all true. I mean, if you're already living in the um, Keller Williams ecosystem, you know, they have stuff like command. Um, they have, uh, you know, they have a lot of kickstart programs and they've got a lot of, um, it, it just comes from a training background where if you're in the Keller Williams ecosystem, like, you know, just, just go to whoever, Jose, Frank, somebody will get you started uh, on the right path. If you're watching this and you're not in the Keller Williams ecosystem, pay for coaching somewhere uh, but make sure that that coach is good at asking questions, holding you accountable, checking in on the actual deliverables. You know, like one of the things that our coaching uh, clients have to report every week is, did they make their connection calls, right? Because lead generation or prospecting or whatever you want to call it, it's a daily habit. It's just like brushing our teeth. It's just like going to the gym. You know, every time I'm feeling fat, I don't get mad at the gym and be like, well, I did, I did sit-ups like six weeks ago. Why do I not have six pack abs? Well, it's cause it's a daily habit. Right. And so make sure if you're looking for a coach that you, uh, that, that they're holding you accountable to the activities, you know, you need to be doing. Cause so many of us adults, I, I think Frank and I qualify as adults. There's, there's not very much that we have to learn, but there's a whole lot that we have to be reminded of. And even though I teach this stuff, I preach about it. I literally wrote a book on the subject. I still need my coach to remind me every Monday. All right, cool. Did you print out your new call tracker for the week? Are you making those connection calls? Are you touching base with at least 10 people a day? You know, that's the stuff that we have to hear and be reminded of, especially right now when it's kind of uncomfortable to be making those calls. You know, uh, we've got coaching clients that I'm talking to every day saying like, hey, Scott, what's the script? How do I how do I reach out in a genuine fashion without feeling like I'm being, you know, a little bit um, just slimy of like using this time to prospect? I'm like, hey, man, people just want to have real conversations with other human beings. I'm just calling a bunch of realtors I know and be, hey, how are you doing? How are you and your family doing? How are you holding up? You know, luckily, I've done a lot of mortgages and personal loans for the realtors I work most closely with. So I have some insight into their, you know, financial background. I can talk to them a little bit like, Hey, you know, Bill's always my fictitious realtor. Uh, Hey, Bill, thank God we paid off all that debt, right? Two years ago and got you on a path of like financial freedom, because now you're not freaking out that you've got 90 days without a paycheck or that you've got a 60 day slowdown. So I, I think people are just really yearning, especially right now for those genuine conversations. And if you're willing to pick up the phone and make those 10 or 20 calls a day, like people are hungry for those authentic conversations to talk about where things might be going in the future. 100%, 100%. And you know, this is not, this is not a PC uh, webinar that I'm doing. So like, if you're not with Keller Williams, I am doing this because I wanna recruit you and I want to coach you and Scott wants to coach you. Scott coaches, coaches lenders and he coaches real estate agents. I just coach real estate agents. But I, I am putting this out there because I wanna do this because I believe I can help you through this time. I've been through tough markets. I've been through crap that I would never want anybody else to go through. And I have a ton of tools and resources to help you. But at the end of the day, it's gonna, it's gonna come down to your work ethic and your willingness to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation. And that's the things that we're gonna talk about because you're gonna have to do things that you've never done before. And you're gonna have to look at this business 180 degrees different than you have before when we get through this. And a lot of you probably are gonna like it. And I'm okay with that. Um, 
by so, the way, shout out, shout out to Liz who just emailed me for a copy of the book, which I'm going to get in the mail to you uh, today, Liz. My, uh, my rock star assistant here is um, sitting to my left and she's going to get a copy out to you. So if you guys want a copy of the book, Lead Generate 61 Days to Double Your Pay, just shoot me an email, Scott at Scott Groves team. I'll get a copy overnight to you today. Yep. That's awesome. So what is a lead? So everyone on the planet is going to buy, sell or rent property at some point in their lives. So literally everybody on this planet is a lead. We value what a lead is based on how close they are to actually buying or selling. And to me, that is the biggest problem that we have in this industry. That if somebody just buys a house and then you get that person as a lead the next day after they buy a house, that that lead is deemed not very good. Or if that person is not willing to buy in the next six to 12 months, that lead is deemed not very good. And I think we have that backwards because that's why everybody pays Zillow and pays all these services to get a lead that's ready to buy right now. At the end of the day, the relationship is what's the most important thing. Your database, the, when you find people, you put them in your database. Your database should include your people, and how do you know they're your people? If, if they aren't your people, how do you get them to be your people? So when someone buys a house with you and they close escrow, the next day is when the relationship really begins. And so many people, agents are, are very uh, transient in their business and they close a deal and then you don't ever talk to them again. And I'm guilty of this. When I first started in the business, I was closing so many deals that I was just, I was so concerned with getting to the next deal that I let those relationships go. And in reality, your goal should be taking as many people as you can, as fast as you possibly can and putting them into your database, not worrying if they're going to close a deal tomorrow, but keeping that relationship going because they have to be your people. There's so many people right now that have so many agents that have people in their database. And if you call through their entire database, they've either recently bought, purchased, or sold something with somebody else because they never went back. And I think what's this statistic that over 70% of people who just bought a house say they would use their last realtor, but then it's under 30% of the ones that actually do. And that's because we don't follow up with them. And the people in your database, a lot of people would argue, these are my people, they're in my database. So you take, you're assuming the fact that those people in your database are not in anybody else's database. And you would be absolutely 100% wrong because I, they're in Zillow's database. I know that, but there's 10,000 agents in the San Fernando Valley, a, a part of our, part, our San Fernando Valley board. I can guarantee you, your people are in somebody else's database. And whether they're not, whether they're your people or not will depend on how much you follow up with them and how much you talk to them. So this is my thing. So I, I was trying to, about a month ago, when all this craziness started happening, I had an epiphany and I was thinking, there's something about to happen that a lot of people aren't paying attention to. And then I was, I was trying to get Scott on the phone, but we were both going a little crazy. We couldn't get on the phone. But this is what I was going to ask you, Scott. I was going to ask you, you know, people are doing these things called forbearances. Now, back when I started in real estate, a forbearance was like, you know, you miss a payment and you miss six months of payments. They take that forbearance and they put it at the end of the loan. So like I was trained, that's a forbearance. But people are like, oh, no, 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 no. The bank is going to waive your first three months, your next three months. And it's going to be a forbearance. No. But what they, what they, but what they did differently is that they're going to take those. And, and I have no clue how this helps. I, I'm confused on how this is supposed to help. They take the next three months of payments and they move them to the fourth month. So you don't have three months of payments, but then you have four months of payments in the fourth month. And I'm like, okay, if I couldn't pay my mortgage this month or next month, but then in the fourth month, I have to come up with, I, I'm confused. I don't understand this. Now, this is the problem I don't think a lot of people see coming is that there's over a trillion dollars worth of equity in the homes across the United States right now. Everybody's being made to shelter in place, made to stay at home, they're quarantined. And people are gonna start not paying their mortgage. They're gonna, there's 10 million people have filed for unemployment. All this equity is gonna start going away because people aren't gonna make their payments. The banks aren't, there's this whole 
loan part and finance part that you are so much more agile at explaining, but I think you know where I'm going is that this equity is going to end up going away. And so what happens when people don't make their mortgage payment for three months? So yeah, I think it's a really important point and I've been trying to talk about it as much as possible. Forbearance does not mean forgiveness. Forbearance does not mean forgiveness. And, and somehow, you know, not surprisingly, you know, the right hand of the government and the left hand of the banks both came out with like some different ideas on this and they're clearly not talking to each other. They're sure as heck not holding hands like they need to be. And so what I'm telling people is, you know, come hell or high water, if you have a way to make your mortgage payment, make your mortgage payment. Now, look, um, you and I are staying in our lane, you know, agents, finance, mortgage market. Obviously, you and I are very sympathetic to anybody who's actually dealing with the disease or is actually having to make those, you know, personal economic decisions like, do I put food on the table for my family or do I pay my mortgage? Okay, if you're in that situation, do whatever you have to do to free up cash flow. But if you're kind of kicking the idea around, ah, it'd be nicer to have that money in my pocket versus not have that money in my pocket, make your mortgage payment because the forbearance is confusing. What's gonna happen after the three months is confusing. There's some very scary statistics out there that if one fourth of American uh, mortgage holders uh, put their mortgage on forbearance, the entire lending market grinds to a halt, which means the housing market is going to grind to a halt and we're gonna wipe out potential equity in the housing market. It's like, if you can do it, if you can make your mortgage payment, if you can get this message out to your clients, make your payment if you can. Because look, anybody who was around in 2009 and saw how these HARP programs and HARPA programs and all these things never really seemed to work exactly how they were supposed to, um, you, you know the banks just can't talk to the government and the bank's not good at talking to the consumer and the left hand's not talking to the right hand. Just make your payment if you can. If you can't, I get it, you know, shoot me an email, give me a call, we can talk through your options, I can explain this stuff to you. But again, if you can beg, borrow or steal to make your mortgage payment till we come out of this, then please do that because you're gonna be in a much better spot come six months from now. And, and this is the one thing that I think is really important is that they, they, they were trying to come out with all these loans and all these unemployment and all this money to give people. And, and I filled out a few things. I had some agents fill out a few things and they said within 36 hours, within three days, you're gonna get money and all this is gonna happen. Let me tell you, nothing has happened. You, if, you cannot put all of your faith into the federal government and hoping that they're gonna do what they say because a lot of this stuff, nobody's dealt with. They're trying to figure it out just like we're trying to figure it out. So be very, very, very careful because this mortgage thing that's about to happen, it's going to be bigger than, I feel it's going to be bigger than anybody even thought it was going to be. Yeah, I, I think what we're all trying to wrap our heads around is, is this going to feel more like 9-11-2001 or is this going to feel more like pretty much the entire year 2010-2009? And what I mean by that is after 9-11, and we don't have to go into all the politics of how that led to a 20-year war, but after 9-11, unless you lived specifically in downtown Manhattan, you know, the mortgage market started working again quickly. Wall Street was shut down for, I think, three or four days, which is the only time in American history that's happened, but then they opened up again. Um, you know, it was, it was about a month or so before life as usual in, in, you know, the general population of America got back to business as usual, you know, yeah. transactions were going forward, loans were being made, houses were being sold. Um, now, is this COVID-19 virus and slowdown, is this going to look more like 9-11 or is this going to look more like 2009 where the mortgage markets, you know, start to seize up, product starts to go away, there's a six month slowdown. And now, you know, we're looking at a six month to a year to 18 months slowdown in the mortgage and housing market. I don't know the answer to that question. But what I do know to give everybody kind of a silver lining is those realtors, whether it's a one month disruption or a, you know, one decade disruption, those realtors and loan officers that continue to make the connections and focus on the relationships and do the lead generation, when we do come out of this in 30, 60, 90, 180 days, then they're just going to have more market share, right? And so somebody asked you, uh, Frank, you know, what could they be doing from home if they're new in the business to come out of this the other side? 
and I think, you know, you can shoot me an email. I can send you this realtor weekly call tracker, um, or you can use any other number of systems out there. Making 10 quality phone calls and connections a day is going to be the difference between I come out of this in 60 days and I'm no longer a realtor and I need to find another job, or I come out of this with a thriving pipeline and database where I'm the trusted source to go to if somebody needs to buy or sell a home. And I think that's, you know, I think that's what we need to be thinking about right now. Control the things that we can control. Yep. hundred percent, hundred percent. So contact Scott and he'll shoot this out to you. Um, and he's a huge resource. He put this together and it, it's, it's amazing. We're going to get into some details on, because I think one of the things that a lot of people are talking about is like, well, what conversations can I actually have right now? Um, so let, let's, let's make this clear. You are not in the business of buying and selling real estate. You're in the business of creating and maintaining relationships. That's it. Hard stop. That's it. Your relationship is most valuable immediately after the transaction, not before. The fastest. Can I share a funny story, Frank? I just, 100%. I, have to, I have to jump in and I know I'm going to butcher this story. So please, <laughs> no one send this to Christoph Chu. But Christoph Chu is a realtor over on the west side, uh, Sotheby's, multi-million, you know, $10 million, $20 million properties. Um, I actually think he works, anyway, well, I think he's a private guy now. Anyway, he tells this great story about, and again, I'm going to butcher the story, but the lesson, the lesson is the same. He tells this great story how he had like this, these two brothers from Abu Dhabi or Saudi Arabia or whatever. And they were moving here with a, with a, you know, backpack full of cash. And they're like, we have to live close to the Playboy mansion. Like we want that, that LA lifestyle. We want to, you know, be able to Instagram it. So he sells in this house. I, again, I'm going to butcher the numbers, but who cares? The lesson is the same. He sells them a house for like $8 million and it was a pretty tough transaction and whatnot. And after the transaction, his coach reminded him, Hey, the relationship starts after the transaction is over. Make sure you follow up. Make sure you're checking in. Make sure you're delivering your closing gift. And, and he admitted on stage, he's like, yeah, I just didn't really want to do it. You know, it was, it was a tough transaction. So he does the follow-up and he does his 30-day follow-up, his 60-day follow-up, his 90-day follow-up. Like less than 90 days later, because he was following up, even though it was a tough transaction, there was maybe a little bit of tough blood leaving the transaction. Because he did the follow-up and ingratiated himself, on like his 90 day follow up, they're like, hey, there's a house two doors closer to the Playboy Mansion. Can you sell our $8 million house and help us buy this $11 million house that's three doors over? And so his $8 million transaction turned into $30 million of transactions wow. because he did the post, the post closing follow up. And again, I'm sure I wildly butchered that story, but you, you get the gist of it. And uh, when he told that story from stage, he's like, it was literally a half dozen phone calls made me another half a million dollars in commissions. Now, most of us aren't playing in that price point, but the lesson is the same. Like how hard is it to follow up with our clients after we close? And I get it. I know that that's hard. I know that it's easy to like move on to the next transaction, but that's just a great story. Um, and then there was one other point that I wanted to bring up, uh, Frank, this idea of uh, the, the reticular activating system, reticular activating system. And, and you know what that is. It's, you know, I'm thinking about buying a red Tesla. I actually have it on order. I'm not sure if I'm going to take delivery of it based on everything <laughs> that's going on. But now because it's in my mind that I want to buy a red Tesla, every other car that I see on the freeway is a red Tesla because I just have it in my mind. Same thing when your clients are buying a house, refinancing a house, they just closed on a house. It's in their mind that they wanted to buy a house and they want to talk about financing and they want to talk about the, the new gardener that they just hired to take care of their house. So they're talking to and they're seeing in their life all the other people that want to buy a house. So because of that reticular activation system that happens in our brain, intrinsically, your clients that are buying or selling a house are talking all day, every day to other people that want to buy or yeah. sell a house. And so you've got to be asking them for those referrals and asking the questions because if not, you're just leaving a mountain of referral business on the table. Yeah, you're, you're hundred percent right. And I think you touched on something that's really super important that agents do all the time. And is that they tell themselves a story and they use that story to not follow up and to not have conversations with people because whatever happened at the other end of that transaction with that other person, you have in your mind how that went, but guess what? 
I'd say 90% or more times you're actually wrong on how that went and they're telling themselves a separate story. So the key is the relationship, getting into relationships with as many people as you can possibly get into and as fast as you possibly can and put them into your database as quickly as you can and then communicate with them as much as you can. And, and this is just the basics, know, like, and trust. People are going to do business with you when they know you, when they like you, and when they trust you, period. And, you know, that, those, are, those are just really good stories because it really accentuates, you know, what all that, how all that stuff is really important and what it really means. So this is how you have conversations with everybody you meet right now. Right now, you can pick up the phone and you can start having conversations. So this is the thing. I was coaching an agent and I gave them this system. And a couple days later, they came into my office and they said, you know what, that thing you gave me, that fourth thing you gave me, that really worked. And I go, I know. And they go, but I didn't get the result I wanted. And I go, well, what, what result did you want? He goes, well, I wanted a signed contract. And I said, that's your problem. Your problem is, is you're focused on the contract and you're focused on the deal. You're not focused on the relationship. And people are going to sniff that out and they're not going to want to do business with you because it comes down to know, like, and trust. So knowing you is not an option. Trusting you is not an option. The only part that's an option is that is liking. If you get the job done and you're really good at what you do, they don't actually have to like you to use you. And I know a ton of people out there. I know a ton of agents out there that I just, they're just not likable people. They're just not, a lot of people don't like them, but they're still doing 20 to 30 to 40 million in sales because people know them and they get the job done and they're trustworthy because they know that they're going to get the result that the pe that people want. So I give all my coaching clients the Ford script, family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. When you call someone, you talk to them. These are, the, these are the categories you go through. You don't ask them for a business. You don't talk about selling their property. And this is why this is important. Right now, 10 million people filed for unemployment last month. There's going to be a slow roll on certain things that are happening with certain people because I know restaurants that are going out of business. I know um, the ice station in Santa Clarita closed down not even a month into the quarantine, they're closed. Unless somebody comes in and buys them, buys them, they're not opening back up. So there's gonna be a slow roll with people making decisions and making decisions to sell, to get rid of their property, to walk away from the property, whatever it is. And if you are not in relationship, if you do not know about their family, their occupation, their recreation, the, the things that are closest to them, you're not gonna be the one they call when they can't make their mortgage payment and they have to do something. So you have to get into a relationship with people. So um, going through the Ford script is probably the easiest and best way to do that. So in addition, coming from contribution and actually willing to help people and to care. So if anybody read Gary Vaynerchuk's book, Crush It, the first one from back, I think, 2011, 2010, or it was a long time ago, chapter 11 was one word and it was care. Right now is what you need to do. You need to actually care. So calling people, asking, how are you? Can I help you? What do you need? So I, I, when somebody is in need, we all do this. You know, I'm here for you. Let me know if you need something. That's very passive. So instead of saying that, actually call people and say, hey, listen, I'm going to the grocery store. Do you need any food? Do you need any vegetables? What do you need? Ask them, be proactive about it. Um, just drop something off at their house that you know that they would appreciate. Water, paper goods, whatever. Um, I don't know who the real estate coach is that like promotes pop buys, but pop buys is a perfect thing to do. Just leave it on their doorstep, text them, say, hey, I had some extra paper towels. I wanted to drop them off for you. Um, doing things like that because you're not about trying to sell their house today. Your job is to get into a relationship with them to make sure that when the time comes, whenever that is, that you are the person they call and you are the person that they're thinking of when it comes to buy or sell. It's about cultivating the relationship. That's it. Your job is to get as many people in your database and to follow up with this. Did you go to the bathroom? What did you do? I had to wrangle my kids. <laughs> um, 
But I, you know what? I, I probably sound like a broken record, but I cannot tell you how important this is. We are so, this market that we're just coming out of, if you got a cold call and you put something, if, if you got a call, a come list me call, and somebody's like, yeah, I want to sell my house, and you got that contract signed, that was almost like getting a check signed. That was how quickly things were closing. That's not going to happen anymore. Not as much. It's going to change. And so the way you fix this and the way you come out of this way bigger than when you started is that you have to start grabbing as many people as you possibly can, helping as many people as you possibly can and putting them in your database and constantly talk to them to make sure that they know that you're there to help them. And then when it comes time to sell their house, to buy a house, to stop renting, you're going to be the one they call. And I just, I want to just keep saying this because this is the most important thing. And I find that a lot of realtors have an easier time making a cold call to an expired listing than actually calling people they know. And to me, that you know, frustrates the crap out of me. It's funny. There's, there's another book uh, that I'm a big fan of called uh, The Entrepreneur Roller Coaster by Darren Hardy. Great and, book. And again, another story that I'm going to butcher, um, but I'll get the gist of it. Uh, you know, Darren Hardy said he went to this hotel chain, whatever, the Ritz. And um, everybody was just super accommodating. You know, everybody was trying to make his stay better. They were super nice. And he was, he was kind of so confused because he was used to a hotel industry where it's very transactional and everybody's just like, check me in, here you go. So he, he asked to speak to the manager and he's like, hey, you know, I really, I really just don't understand. Like what training program are you using to make these people so nice and accommodating? And the manager gen genuinely looked at it and said, I don't understand the question. And Darren Hardy goes, well, you know, I'm a sales coach and I'm a business coach. Like, how do you get people to, to act so nice and treat people with, you know, such love and care? And the manager's like, no, really, I'm, I'm not understanding the question. And so he like restates it five times. And finally, the manager goes, well, I think what you're missing is like, we don't train them. We just hire nice people. <laughs> and he's like, oh, the light bulb went off. He's like, you know, kind of about that idea, like you just have to care about people what's the best way to make people think that you care about them is actually care about them. Yeah. And, and I got to tell you, I'm, I'm bad at this because our job in the mortgage business is a little bit more transactional. It's a little bit more commoditized. It's hard for me to not treat the file and the client as a conveyor belt that just goes through the system of getting a loan. I, I really struggle with this of showing people that I care and then, you know, I'll be up at two o'clock in the night internalizing, like, did I do the best thing for the client? Oh my God, did that appraisal get ordered? Should I have locked the rate in today or do we lock the rate in tomorrow? Like, I know in my heart of hearts, I care, but sometimes it's hard to get that out onto paper and get it out into the conversation. So, you know, whatever trick you guys have that are watching this to show your clients that you really care, I think that's really important. Um, there's a couple of questions here, uh, yep. Frank, I wanted to address. Um, you know, somebody asked, Hey, what if we're the ones who need the help? You know, yeah. what if we're, what if we're struggling? So do you want to talk a little bit real quick about the resources that are out there? Uh, you know, from a government standard, from a coaching standard, from KW, like what's out there as far as help? Yeah. So we did a video, we did a webinar and I can shoot that, um, out to you as far as the things that are out there for help and it's constantly changing. So, um, as far as financial help or government help, again, these things are out there. A lot of people have filled them out, but nobody's seen anything yet. Uh, so I can get you those resources and show you those resources. Um, but in, in, a, in a general sort of way, so like if you're upset and you're depressed or you're unhappy, one of the best ways to um, get yourself out of that state is actually go help somebody else. Go help somebody else in the same predicament you are. So if you're somebody that needs help, you know, first of all, ask, ask for help. Find somebody, find family, find friends, find whatever you need. Ask people for help. Um, if you need food, ask. Like, I, the pride is one of the biggest things that, that hurt people is because they're too, quote, unquote, prideful. Listen, I, stop giving it. And, and pride is like really caring about what other people think. Like, stop giving a crap about what other people think. If you need help, if you need something, start asking because I can guarantee you somebody in your network or somebody that you know, I know, Scott knows, we know how to get you help or point you in the right direction to get you help or we can actually help you. I'm going to sneeze. Oh my God, I can't do uh, Okay. So that, that's, my, that's my short answer to that is that um, we have links that are going out through my office to everybody as far as filling out the forms for the PPP program and for the, uh, um, the SBA program and all that stuff. Um, but as far as like 
upset, depression, um, stress, all of these things, getting into action and actually helping people in your community. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, um, I was talking to Tracy today and she came up with a great idea is that she went out to, to uh, our neighborhood and she's like, hey, who needs school supplies? And so she's, so, you know, instead of us sitting at home, binge watching Tiger King and stressing about what's happening in the market, it's like, we're going to get into action and we're going to go out and actually help people. We've gone to the grocery store, we'd help people. And the thing is, is that, you know, that type of karma comes back to help you in the long run as well. I don't Let's know be how clear. Let's be clear. Everybody needs to watch Tiger King. <laughs> Let's just make sure that we put that out there. If I get $10,000 from the government, I'm going to go buy a tiger. That's all. Yeah. Number, number one way to feel better about your life, no matter what the scenario is, is watch Tiger King and be thankful that you are nobody in that entire documentary. Um, it's like, it's like the most voyeuristic, thank God I'm not this person. Uh, another great question, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a listing at this time, or you have a listing coming up because people have to sell, you know, how do you go about selling it in a time when, um, you know, you can't have a big cattle call uh, open house? And maybe you can give your answer and then I'll give my answer on yep. what else, what I'm seeing based on the deals that are actually going under contract. Yeah. So, um, so I have a lot of, so a lot of this is happening right now. There's people that are taking listings right now and, and they're, they're not sure if they're going to sell or not. But the key to selling a listing is two things is you have to price it right and you have to give it exposure. So if you have a listing, um, so like um, Tracy took one out in Simi Valley. And one of the things that I told her is I said, go back in the MLS the last six months to a year of everybody that sold anything in Simi Valley and call every one of those agents and tell them what you have. And see, do they have a buyer? Do they have anybody? Do they know anybody? But that's, that's a gr grassroots way to market yourself is to talk to everybody that sold something in the neighborhood. Call the buyer agent, call the listing agent, call both of them. You never know. Um, but exposure and the key is pricing it right. And then I, I'd say the third thing is communication with your clients so they understand that if you came up with a $750,000 price yesterday, that that is most likely not going to be what it sells for. And it's probably going to be lower over communicating, being honest with them and making sure that you know what their, what their options are as far as how low they, how they can lower their price or what else they can do if they can't lower their price. Yeah. You know, another thing that I'm seeing, Frank, that I'm pretty encouraged by, and uh, you know, this might be an unpopular comment uh, for a lot of realtors, I love but it. the reality is, uh, you know, open houses, yes, they're there to show the houses, but let's be honest, it's, it's in a big, big way. Maybe even its primary function is to be a marketing tool for the realtor so that you can meet the neighborhood. You know, you can potentially pick up new buyers, new sellers. And so what I would see a lot is let's say, you know, 60 days ago when the market was quote unquote normal, 60 people would come through the open house, 15 people would inquire with the realtor eight people would write an offer. But if we're really being honest with ourselves, there was only two or three real offers that were ever really in the running. You know, there's, there, for every property, I don't care, I don't care if it was, you know, Eagle Rock four years ago, which was the hottest market and there were 60 offers per property. When push came to shove, there was really only two or three quote unquote good offers or best offers or kind of front runners in that deal. Um, and the reality is, I think something that a lot of realtors are losing focus of, it only takes one. <laughs> only one person can buy each house that goes on the market. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the fact that the marketing tool of doing big cattle call open houses has gone away for realtors, which makes, you know, this call tracker even more important that you're making your connections in another way. But don't mistake the fact that the marketing opportunity of the open house versus the ability to sell the house has gone away because I, I have buyers that are calling me right now that are like, Hey, I'm super serious. I wanted to buy. This is my opportunity to get into a house without having to compete against 10 offers. Maybe yeah. I only have to compete against the other serious offer. And so I'm still selling, seeing deals transact and go under contract. And just remember, we don't want our own personal problems, AKA, I can't do the open house and market to the neighborhood and talk to 60 or 70 people in the cattle call. That's our problem as lenders and realtors. Let's make sure we don't project that problem onto the marketplace and make people more scared than they already are. Because the reality is it only takes one, 
maybe two offers to get a house sold. And I'm still seeing things sell. So maybe an unpopular opinion amongst realtors, because obviously you guys need those open houses to generate future business, but there's still deals happening. There's still buyers in the market right now. Now, you know, I was, I was recruiting an agent from another company and, and, and her number one thing was open houses. And if that's your number one and that's your only thing, then you have a different problem. But I, I like to look at things as, 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 I went, as I've gone through my life, I've gone through so many difficulties and so many train wrecks and so many issues that I realized problems are not problems, they're opportunities. What's, uh, what's my favorite quote from Jack Sparrow? Your problem isn't the problem, your problem is your attitude about the problem. And I think that if you think that not doing open houses is a problem, then you need to delve into your creativity because I know myself and other top agents have sold houses that they've never been to, they've never looked at, they've never seen. And that is, this is just another opportunity for you to get more creative and to pivot your business. Um, I, a lot of people ask me, should I go buy a Matterport camera? I do not think you need to go buy that camera. I do not necessarily think you need to do Matterports. Um, there's enough, if you take quality enough photographs or if you have enough information, you can sell a property right now um, without leaving your house. Um, if you need help, I have a whole office full of people that can help you. Um, Scott is an amazing resource to help you. So there is a lot of, so the, the big thing here is that you said a normal market. So I think in the last 10 years, a normal market for us is basically we get a house, we list the house, we put it on the market, and then it sells within a week. Let's be honest, that's not a normal market. That's just what we're used to. I mean, a normal market's what, three to six months of, you know, it sits on the market for three to six months. That's supposed to be a, a buyer versus seller's market that's supposed to be even. I, have you ever seen that market? No, no. <laughs> we, we basically got spoiled by a 10-year bull market. And, you know, one of the people I'm a big, a big fan of is Barry Habib. He's a financial analyst. And, you know, he was saying last summer, hey, guys, the recession is coming. You know, I, I, I have him on, on film actually saying, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be a blow up of the student loan market or a pandemic, laugh out loud, or the election cycle or whatever it is, but we've basically been in a 10 year bull market, some type of flattening, correction, or drop of asset prices. And I say asset prices, I mean, you know, gold, stocks, housing, pork bellies, everything has just gotten exponentially more expensive over the last 10 years. The correction was coming. It's just unfortunate that the correction had to come with this health issue that's yeah. also negatively affecting people. But it was coming. Like this is not. This is not. Uh, this is not new information. No, no. I mean, so we look at unemployment. Unemployment was at a historic low. It was uh, I think it was under three percent. And last year, like five point seven million houses sold. Five point seven million. We just had ten million people file for unemployment. So there is going to be an opportunity for you to go help people. And the way you help people is you go out and you get into a relationship, you talk to as many people as you can, and you put them in your database. One of the great things about Keller Williams is that we have a thing called Command, which is an amazing database where you can put people in and it'll help you actually follow up with them. It'll tap you on the shoulder. Hey, call that person. Hey, do this. It's, it's amazing. If you want more um, help on that or questions on that or want to find out more information, um, contact me. I'll be more than happy to sit you down with my command expert in my office to, uh, to show you all the things that we do that are going to help you. Um, but the opportunities are coming, but the way you approach it is going to be different. You're not going to call expired listings anymore. You're not going to do all those things because you don't want to be that slimy salesperson that's out there looking for a sale. You want to grow your database, grow your relationships, as quickly as you possibly can and be there to help as many people as you can possibly help because make no mistake about it. Six months from now, there's a whole bunch of realtors that are not going to be in the business anymore. And there's realtors that are listening to what Scott and I are saying right now. And they're actually going to do what we say and they're going to make seven figures. Like the, when the REO back in 2008, when the REOs and the short sales and all that came out, there's agents that were driving Toyotas and ended up driving Mercedes and, um, and actually uh, lenders that I knew they were driving Lambos because they grew their database as big as they possibly could. And they went out to help people. So, yeah, know. you know, Frank, one of the things that I'm hearing from uh, a lot of my coaching clients, and it's kind of a, it's a really destructive process and psyche and mindset is they're saying, well, 
you know, it's the coulda, shoulda, woulda. You know, what I should have done the last two years is have more business, save more money, you know, learn how to use bomb bomb, learn how to use slide broadcast, got in a relationship with more people. I'm like, look, man, it's like that old saying, the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. Yep. The second best time to plant a tree is today. So if you're stuck at home or you don't have a bunch of business right now, in addition to making the calls, you know, use this time to set up whatever it is you feel like you quote unquote should have set up before, you know, become an expert in command, figure out your own database. If you're using a third party vendor, you know, get familiar with some technology tools, learn how to run a Facebook ad for 10 bucks. You know, Facebook, we voluntarily give it so much information. You can literally tell Facebook if you figure out how to do it. I only want to advertise to people in Porter Ranch up above the 118 who, you know, like HGTV on Facebook and they have three kids. I mean, you can get that granular and that detailed. So if there's something you wish you would have done the last year, two years, 10 years in this business, use this time when we're stuck at home to make the connections, deepen the relationship, and then go sharpen that ax, right? So that in 30 or 60 days, when you come out swinging, you can just top, uh, chop down those trees even faster. And I think that's a really good thing to take away from this is like, yeah, stuff kind of sucks right now. Um, this is really challenging, but guess what? The good news is, is that if you plant those trees now and you embrace the suck, those realtors that don't make it through the next 90 days or 180 days, when the market comes back, you're gonna get their market share, right? Everybody who's on this call right now knows that realtor in their neighborhood who doesn't do a particularly great job, takes the listing photos you know, with their iPhone with no lighting, but whatever, they get the business because it's their buddy or their golf friend or their brother-in-law. We want those people to fall out of the industry so that when things come back stronger, the people that are the professionals who embraced the suck and made the deeper relationships, they pick up all that market share on the back end because the weak realtors fall out. So that's my thought on that. No, you're absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. And Victor, I know you're watching this right now. Um, I'm going to have Greg get in touch with you and we're going to uh, make sure that you, uh, you, uh, you are set up for success. And one of the things, um, you know, what Scott said in the chat there is a hundred percent on point as far as what you need to be doing. So um, I, I hate to over, oversimplify everything because I haven't given you anything that's like tremendously amazing. It's super basic and it's super simple, but it's actually what actually needs to happen. And that is the first step, getting into relationships with people. The next step, this is where I would say you would need a coach because your next step is going to be the part that sets you up for success. Um, if, you, if you ever watch the TV show, The Profit, which I love, but any business owner that is successful knows their numbers and you have to know your numbers. You have to, you will not be successful or you will, you will always make under $200,000 a year if you don't know your numbers. I think every real estate agent on the planet should be able to make a minimum of 250 plus thousand dollars a year. But at the end of the day, it comes down to knowing your contacts, your appointments, your appointments to listings taken and buyers taken and then your closings and then how much money you make. So that becomes a numbers game. That's the next step. So don't, Focus on that right now, but that, if you call me and you say, Frank, I really like what you and Scott had to say, I wanna be coached. We're gonna start talking about everything that we talked about on this, but then we're gonna start tracking your contacts, appointments, listings to buyers and closings. We're gonna start tracking that, and then we're gonna put together a formula to where you will know exactly how many contacts you need to make this year to make whatever dollar amount you wanna make. You'll say, huh, I wanna take a vacation to Hawaii, I just need to do uh, 250 more contacts this year and you'll be able to quantify it in a, in a more business um, format. So that's the next step. Um, I don't know, what else? Do you have anything else, Scott? I mean, the last thing I would say, and I, I really appreciate the stats that you track, because I think a lot of coaches, a lot of managers, they only track the lagging indicators. So, you know, in, in the mortgage business, for example, every manager talks about, well, how many deals did you close this month? How many deals did you close this month? Well, guess what? If a manager or a coach is only tracking how many deals did you close, you know, that deal took 30 days. That client was out shopping for 60 days before that. That relationship for the realtor that referred me the loan, that relationship happened 60 days from there. So for a manager to only be tracking the closed deals, 
you're five or six months behind. Like that person, that loan officer is out of the business by the time you realize there's even a problem. So what we've gotten towards is tracking our five C's in, in our coaching program for loan officers. We track uh, the number of calls that you make, the, the outbound proactive relationship building calls. Then we track the number of contacts that come into the system. So a new lead, a phone number, an email, somebody that might want to get a loan. Then we track the credit pools. Credit pools are the number one leading indicator for a mortgage company or a loan officer because if I'm in relationship enough where they let me pull their credit, then A, they're probably serious enough to buy a house that they know that their credit is decent, and B, they've kind of picked me to do their mortgage because they're letting me pull their credit, and then we track contracts and we do track closings. What I would say is right now is that time for realtors and loan officers to be tracking their leading indicators, meaning how many outbound calls are you making? How many relationships are you building? For us, how many credits are we pulling? For you, that's probably how many listing presentations or buyer consults you're doing. But if you're not tracking those leading indicators and you're just getting focused on, oh my God, I don't have something closing, I don't have something closing. Well, then the desperation comes out, the panic comes out, and you don't do any of the leading activities that are gonna get you to the business. So it's this, whatever the opposite of a virtuous cycle is. What we wanna do in this time of downtime is start that virtuous cycle and be like, okay, today the thing I can control is making 10 connections. That's the beginning of my virtuous cycle where I'm gonna control the controllables, I'm gonna focus on the leading indicators, I'm gonna make my calls, and then I just know, like if I make my calls, that leads to business and a paycheck in my pocket 90 days from now, and then I continue to like nurture that relationship and that's going to lead to more business and that's going to lead to more business. But like Frank says, focus on the relationship. You focus on the relationship by focus on the leading indicators uh, of making the calls and trust me, everything else takes care of itself. Absolutely. So we have a question. How do you find a coach? What does it cost? So um, I know we both, you and I both do coaching a little bit differently. One of the things that I do is my coaching is custom. So um, I work with your time, I work with your dollar amount, I work with where you are in your business. Um, you know, a, a $20 million producer is gonna be coached differently than somebody that's just starting the business. Um, so it just depends. So um, Scott can answer that question as well, but I would say, you know, after this, contact both of us or either one of us, whoever you think your style is gonna work best for you and uh, either one of us can help you out for sure. Yeah, I would say, you know, I've spent everywhere from $29 a month to $2,900 a month for my coach. And I've gotten, you know, varying levels of success from the different, you know, the different entities. You know, if you don't have the money to hire a coach right now, shoot me an email. I'll send you a list of materials, you know, YouTube links, books, like some of the greatest coaches in the world, are a $14 book. You know, um, so now the key is you have to read the book and actually implement it. But uh, if you don't have the money for a coach, then by all means, uh, a book will do for most people. Uh, and if you want some resources, man, Frank and I probably know or have worked with just about every coach in the business. Todd Duncan, Brian Buffini, uh, the fairies of the world. I, I, I know, I, I didn't mean fairies, like Tom Ferry and Mike Ferry. <laughs> um, so we, uh, we, we, we know what we're talking about. Shoot us an email, we'll set you up with the right person. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I, I could go on talking all day because that's what I do. Uh, this is my contact information here, um, my hey, Facebook hi. and my YouTube. Hey, hey, what's going on? I think her timer went off because she brought me her rain boots to go on our lunchtime walk. So I got to get out of here. There you go. There's yeah, Scott's I'll... information. If you guys have any questions for Scott, just shoot him a message. Shoot me a message. Um, but, you know, let's do our thing. I hope this was helpful for everybody. Um, you know, and I hope, I hope uh, Scott and I can help you guys out today. Yeah, here for all your questions. If you've got a client that needs some, uh, you know, instilling confidence to let them know that the housing market will still be here. If they've got loan questions, finance questions, uh, here to help. Anything I can do. All right, Scott, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on with me, man. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, let's do a, a virtual happy hour later. All right, sounds good. Have a great day, man. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.